internally in Cisco, and, and for most companies, even how many requests they get. Uh, and so the method that I've used to get data for the past three, three, three or four years, uh, later into the project, uh, were sort of three methods. So the first is that I filed countless FOIA requests, um, which, by the way, is really, really easy to do, and I highly recommend it. If you have a blog, you can usually claim that you're a member of the press and not pay any fees. Um, so that's the first method. The second method uh, is I, I've snuck into uh, places I shouldn't be. Uh, I went to a surveillance industry conference in 2009, commonly nicknamed the wiretappers ball, um, where I was able to, to hear from many uh, telephone company employees, figure out what they were doing. And then the, the third and most fruitful method has been to actually go out drinking with the lawyers who work for these companies. Uh, and it turns out they, they really just like having someone listen to what, what they do at work all day. Um, so let's talk briefly about what happens in these firms and what they're able to provide. And, and what I want you to understand, more important than anything, is that the phone companies are not going out of their way to spy on you. It's just sort of it's the cost of doing business. If you want to be in the business of providing telecom services and you're using spectrum given to you by the government, then various federal agencies uh, have leverage over you, and if you don't play by their rules, they take away your spectrum or they, they block the installation of towers, they can make life very, very difficult. And so the phone companies have to go along. Uh, and protecting your privacy is really not that good for, for business. The money, I mean, well, although you may think the profits that the phone companies make are obscene, um, the amount of money that they have to spend to even push back on a request would likely wipe out the profits they'd make from you for a few years. So there's just really no incentive for them to do so. But let me at least talk about what's possible. So largely I'll focus on location data. So we, we all carry cell phones right now and the phones uh, are constantly tr transmitting to towers, particularly if we have smartphones and there are data connections. Um, the government can get three types of location data. They can get historical, actually four types. They can get historical single tower data. They can get um, uh, real-time uh, single tower data, real-time triangulated data, which is based off of multiple towers in some cases, and then real-time GPS data uh, for phones that have GPS chips. Several, I mean, maybe a decade and a half ago, the FCC, um, forced, or Congress passed le legislation, and the FCC forced the carriers to provide E911 location capabilities. So this meant that the carriers had to be able to provide, upon request, location information of a certain degree of granularity. But the FCC left it to the carriers to figure out how they were going to implement that. And the carriers basically split along the CDMA and GSM path. So the GSM providers in the US, which is AT&T and T-Mobile for the most part, they decided to go with uh, estimated time of arrival data. So they installed this box on every tower. It's usually made by a company called True Position. And this triangulates the location of, of your device. It works in, indoors and it works outdoors and it doesn't require the assistance of any phone uh, in the field. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's fairly sophisticated technology. So they decided that they would go with, with that path. Uh, Verizon and Sprint decided that they didn't want to do that and instead they put GPS chips in every phone. Whether the phone costs 20 bucks or $500, Verizon and Sprint just put GPS to, chips in the, in the devices and then upon request the phone companies can locate individuals. Why does this matter? Why, why this difference? Well, um, not every device on the Sprint and Verizon network can provide GPS information. The E911 rules only apply to phones, to telephones that you can use to call an ambulance during an emergency, and your laptop or tablet or other data device cannot be used to make calls. And so Sprint and Verizon do not provide E911 capabilities for those data devices. What this means is that when the government wants to locate a data using user, a data using device in real time, uh, they're not able to uh, for those two, two networks. All right, so what does this mean? The government, and, and, and Catherine will, will walk through the sort of insane legal standards that exist uh, and the ease with which the government can get certain types of data. But what you need to understand is that the government is obtaining vast amounts of location data. Uh, normally, we, we, they're, well, it's much easier to obtain the historical information and the, the cell phone companies are just are creating it and compiling it and saving it, so it's just sort of there, sitting around. Whereas for the prospective information, the real-time information, the GPS or triangulated data, <coughs> the government has to ask beforehand. And so you already have to be under suspicion for the government to ever get that kind of data. So it's much easier for them to get this, the historical stuff. All right, so the, the companies are receiving all these requests. They're essentially flooded with requests. And 
the companies receive so many requests that they have teams of people working 24 hours doing nothing but responding to surveillance requests. The, the numbers vary by carrier, and the carriers ha have just recently made stats available because of a, a letter sent by a member of Congress. What we do know is that the, num the total number of requests uh, by US carriers is approximately one and a half million a year. Um, Sprint receives by, by far the greatest number of requests uh, of any cell phone company. They receive 500,000 <coughs> subpoenas alone. That doesn't include wiretap orders, that doesn't include requests for location data, that doesn't include text message information, just subpoenas, which uh, Catherine will probably explain what, what those can uh, attain. My guess for why Sprint, obtained, why Sprint receives one third of the requests uh, nationwide is that Sprint has basically cornered the market in prepaid cell phones. If you're using Boost, if you're using um, Virgin, if you're using several other prepaid carriers, they're likely using um, Sprint's network. And uh, prepaid phones are popular with low-income people, the young, the poor, people living in urban areas, who are more likely to be the subject of government investigations. I'm not saying they're more likely to be criminals, but they're certainly more likely to be the subject of, of investigations. And so I think that at least partially explains why Sprint receives so many requests. All right, so Sprint's receiving probably 600, 700,000 total requests a year. Um, they're the only company that's broken down the number of location requests they've received, which is 200,000 requests over the last five years, about 40,000 requests a year. That's a lot of requests for them to deal with, and on top of the you know, half a million subpoenas a, a, a year that they receive. And so they have this gigantic team. They have about 200 people doing nothing but responding to surveillance requests. Uh, and Sprint was so inundated with these surveillance requests that it ultimately decided that it couldn't cope. It could not cope with this flood of surveillance. And so what did it do? It created a self-service portal, a, web, a website where law enforcement could log in <coughs> and get this information whenever they wanted. Now the government would have to satisfy the right legal process, but once they met that process with the appropriate court order, they could log in whenever they wanted. Uh, that website was set up in 2008. Between 2008 and 2009, it was used to generate 8 million GPS data points. That's 8 million individual requests by law enforcement agencies. Now, we don't know how many people that, that, that was. It could be the same person being pinged every second. But it, what you should understand is that when surveillance goes from a manual task to being an automated task, to being a self-service task, the number of requests goes up. Uh, now, the phone companies all charge for their assistance, and they charge reasonable costs, whatever that, that, that tends to be. Uh, and over the years, as surveillance has gone from, an, from a manual task, from someone sitting down at a keyboard and typing in an individual request, to being a wholesale, all-you-can-use uh, model, the costs have plunged. And so just, I think, seven or eight years ago, Sprint Nextel charged $150 per GPS pin. Right? Of the, if they charged $150 for the 8 million requests that they've received, that would be $1.2 billion. They would be in, in the black. They actually lost a lot of money. Uh, they've lost money over the last few years. They didn't make $1.2 billion from, from surveillance requests. And what's happened is they went from charging $150 per ping to charging $30 a month, all you can eat, for, for surveillance. And so the police can literally sit at their desk from the comfort of an air-conditioned office. They can track you as you move about your daily life. Well, why does this matter? It matters because the government has scarce resources, right? There are only so many agents who can be tasked with surveillance. And when it takes 10 or 20 FBI agents to tail a suspect as they drive around town, the government has to figure out who it's gonna spy on. Who's important enough to warrant that team of 20 agents? But when a single agent can track 300 people from their desk just by typing an additional command in on the keyboard, well, then the government doesn't have to think as hard about who it wants to spy on. Right? Then anyone who, who appears on their radar uh, is enough to, to get on their, on their request list. Right, so to, to wrap up, and, and, and before I pass over to my colleague, uh, I also want to talk briefly about um, the sketchier areas. So we know that the government is obtaining Historical, historical location data. We know that they're obtaining real-time location data. We know that they're tracking people in real time. We know that in some cases they have Google Maps type interfaces on our desktops with little dots blinking around. We know that. The scary stuff that we don't know very much about right now um, relates to what are called cell tower dumps. So rather than the government saying, you know what, Ashkan is really sketchy, we're gonna spy on him, they say, you know, the people who are near the 7-Eleven, 
they're really sketchy. So we're going to ask the phone company for the information on everyone who's been near a particular tower in a given hour or two or day period. That's hundreds, if not thousands of people. And most of these people are innocent. In fact, the vast majority of these people are innocent and their information ends up in databases. So the, the sort of wholesale um, dragnet type location surveillance is definitely something that is scary that we know very little about. The other, the other really concerning thing uh, is something called a community of interest request, which is that if you are under surveillance, the government will typically get information about everyone that you've called and everyone who's called you. We know from a recent letter that Sprint sent to a member of Congress that when they hand over location information, they hand over location information about both sides of the call, if both sides are using Sprint service. So if I'm being monitored by the government, your location information gets handed over if you call me. So there are some really, really sketchy things happening. We don't know very much. Uh, I'm currently litigating uh, my own uh, lawsuit against the Department of Justice to get some PowerPoint slides about their current and, and cutting edge methods of location surveillance. There are several other lawsuits going by several groups and hopefully um, we'll get a bit more information. The last thing I'll mention before I pass it over, Ash can tee this up. Several of you, I hope, in fact, all of you should use encryption on your smartphone if it's available. Certainly the latest version of Android offers disk encryption. You should certainly be using it on your laptop. So the question that I want you to think about, and I have the answer, but it's a really un unfortunate, depressing answer. But think about this. You're arrested by the police or you go through a, a border and the government grabs your cell phone and they wanna, they wanna see what you're doing. They wanna see what's on there and you have some passphrase and so the data is encrypted. What do they do? Well, if it was your laptop, if you're using TrueCrypt on your laptop or, or FileVault on your, on your Mac, um, they'd be out of luck. Maybe they could force you to hand over your password or maybe they could try and brute force it, but those are the only real options they have. With your cell phone, the smartphone vendor, the platform vendor, Apple or Google, they're in a position to undo the encryption. So the way it works, it varies by, by the two major platform providers. Uh, Apple appears to have some kind of master skeleton key. And so the police send the encrypted phones back to Cupertino and uh, the, uh, the, the folks at Apple will clone the data off of the phone and then send the police a DVD um, with the data from the device and then send it back. So the police never get access to your phone, but they do get all the data off of your phone. My understanding is that Apple insists on a warrant. It took months of begging and bullying before Apple um, finally uh, told me this. Um, Google is different. Um, Google doesn't uh, have the devices sent back to their headquarters. Instead, what happens is that the police ask Google to change your password. Um, so what happens, if you enter the, the, the wrong password into an Android device a few times, it locks you out. And the only way you can get back in is by entering the full um, Gmail address and password. And so what Google will do is change the password to a new one, which they can then give the police. The police get in, and then Google change the password a second time so that your email won't sync and the police won't be able to do ongoing surveillance of you. But in any case, what I want you to understand is that both Apple and Google provide access to encrypted smartphones. And so if you think your smartphone disk encryption is enough, uh, you're wrong. All right, thank you. So hi, I'm going to talk about some of the legal protections uh, that you are entitled to for your location information when the government comes seeking for it. Um, you know, I work at the ACLU and I spend my time challenging government surveillance programs and location information has been one of the most pressing uh, issues we've been dealing with for the last several years. Um, you know, and unfortunately, I'm going to continue on the theme that Chris just struck, which is that the legal protections for this type of information are both uncertain and inadequate. Um, technology has been changing incredibly rapidly, um, and I think it's worth um, pointing this out, right? We just learned uh, from a bunch of letters that Congressman Markey said, uh, was, you know, he requested information from cell phone companies and learned that the cell phone companies get 1.3 million uh, requests for data a year. What is so striking about that is that, uh, you know, 20 years ago, none of this data would have existed. Um, how many of you, for example, had a cell phone uh, in 1990? Right? There's just a few hands up in the audience right now. Most of us didn't. And so um, the government and the FBI in particular com you know, frequently complain about the degree to which they're going dark. Right? 
their surveillance capacities are being stymied by encryption and other technological protections. But the reality is that this is the golden age of surveillance that we all create these vast data tracks that didn't exist before. Um, and, and for the law, this creates some, the, the, the relatively rapid nature of the way this has happened creates some real difficulties. Um, the law tends to evolve incredibly slowly. So for example, you know, the telephone was invented in the late 1800s. It was, 19, it was 1928 before the Supreme Court first weighed in on the question of whether or not the government needs a warrant to wiretap your phone. And it reached the wrong conclusion. It held that it didn't need a warrant based on probable cause, and it took until the 1960s for the Supreme Court to finally rule that if the government wants to listen in on your telephone conversation, it needs a warrant, right? You know, over 60 years that decision took. And so, um, you know, both the courts and the Congress have a lot of catch up to play to figure out how to deal with uh, legal protections for the location information that we generate in vast quantities every day. Um, there are a few different possible sources of legal protection, right? The courts can interpret the Constitution or existing laws to protect location information. Um, Congress can pass a new law. Um, you know, and there's a theoretical third source, right, which is some sort of executive restraint, right? The executive can simply say, well, we're, you know, we're not going to get this sense of information. That's obviously not happening, so there's, there's really just two possible sources. Um, so I'm going to start out for reasons which will hopefully soon become obvious by talking about the Constitution and what it may mean for protection for your location data from mobile carriers. Um, Ben started off by the Constitution, obviously, the Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures, and the default rule is that if the government is carrying out a search, a constitutional search, it needs to get a warrant based on probable cause. Um, ben started out by mentioning the Supreme Court's recent decision in United States versus Jones. Um, I'm going to talk about it in a little more detail because this provides the best um, hope that the Supreme Court will find that you have a Fourth Amendment interest in your, lo your location information. Um, a unanimous Supreme Court held that uh, when you attach, a, when law enforcement attaches a GPS device to your car, that is a search under the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the case arose because the police wanted to track the movements of a nightclub dealer in Washington, D.C. They thought he was involved in drug dealing. Uh, they attached a GPS device to his car, and they actually they got a warrant, but it wasn't a valid warrant for reasons I will spare you. Uh, so he moved to suppress the evidence. The government made the sweeping argument then alluded to earlier that location information simply uh, doesn't implicate the Fourth Amendment at all. You have zero protections for your location information under the Fourth Amendment. And I think because of the extreme nature of that argument, the Supreme Court really took note of what the consequences of that would be um, and held that when they do that, there's a search under the Fourth Amendment. But Jones actually concerns me a lot, and it's because I am, uh, it's because of what the decision doesn't say more than what it does say. And I'm afraid that uh, you know, civil libertarians will see the court's decision in Jones and see that the court did something positive for protecting location privacy and will stop paying attention to this issue when really the decision doesn't go as far as we all wish it, it would. It leaves two essential questions unresolved. Number one, we know now that if you attach a GPS device to someone's car, that is a search under the Fourth Amendment. But the Supreme Court explicitly did not address the question of whether it is the type of search that requires a warrant based on probable cause, or whether some lesser standard will do. So the government, in the past six months since the Jones decision was decided, has filed briefs all around the country arguing that they don't need a warrant, even after Jones, to engage in this form of location tracking. It is sufficient if an officer has a reasonable belief that, you've, uh, that, that tracking your car will turn up evidence of wrongdoing. And they argue that they don't need to go to a judge. That is enough for the officer to simply believe, reasonably, that they, that, that a search will turn up evidence of wrongdoing. That standard, in my opinion, is pretty meaningless and toothless. I think the primary value of the Fourth Amendment is the fact that if you are carrying out an investigation, you have to go to a judge, a neutral magistrate, and you explain why the search will turn up evidence of wrongdoing. And if all Jones means is that you have to think what you're doing is reasonable, it's not going to mean much, very much at all. The second major unresolved question is how Jones applies to mobile devices, right? As, as Ben mentioned, the FBI, for example, says it's using 3,000 
uh, GPS trackers. Uh, it was using 3,000 GPS trackers at the time the Jones decision was issued. But there are a lot more cell phone tracking going on. And it is not clear that the protections for location information against attaching a GPS to device to someone's car are going to apply to cell phone tracking. And to understand why the decision is unclear, you have to look at the majority decision. I mean, the court unanimously held that there was a search, uh, but it didn't agree on the reason why there was a search. And five of the justices, uh, led by Justice Scalia, were uh, very, framed the issue in terms of a trespass, right? This is a common law trespass. An officer had to physically attach a device to your personal property, and that trespassed on your property, and there, when they collected information from it, therefore there was a search, right? It is not, that is obviously not how cell phone tracking works. The government goes to the company to get the information. And those justices uh, said, you know, we will leave for another day the, you know, whether or not it violates the Fourth Amendment to engage in purely electronic surveillance. So it's not clear that the good the court did in Jones for GPS tracking of cars will extend in any way to the mobile location tracking uh, that the government uh, finds much more useful. And in the law, there are actually some good reasons to believe. Uh, you know, the government's argument, the government continues to argue today that it does not implicate the Fourth Amendment to uh, track a cell phone without a warrant based on probable cause, or actually that, that they have to meet any Fourth Amendment standard at all. Catherine, do you want to explain what the government argues right now that they can get? I mean, what kind of location data they can get with a, with a D order? And, and they'll explain this, but what are the various standards for location data? When can, when can they get it? One tower, multi-tower, GPS. Yeah, I'll get to that okay. in a second. I'm going to talk about the statutory scheme um, in just a moment. Um, but so under the Constitution, the government believes um, that because there's no physical trespass when they want cell phone data, um, that the Fourth Amendment is simply not implicated in every state to make that country, th that argument around the country. There's also, as Chris was just mentioning, um, federal statutory law that provides some protection for your electronic data. Uh, the bad news is that the statute has not been updated since 1986, right? That was before the World Wide Web was invented and before people really used cell phones. Um, and it is not clear how that statute applies to location data. Um, so, for example, the government argues, that the government has taken a, a litigation position um, that when it wants to get historical cell phone location information under this outdated statute, it is sufficient if it shows that that information is relevant to an ongoing investigation, um, it, it relevant and material to an ongoing investigation, and it makes the same argument if it wants to engage in real-time single tower tracking. Um, they have taken the position that if they want to do more precise GPS tracking, the Department of Justice recommends um, that law enforcement agents get a warrant based on probable cause. However, um, they don't concede that the Constitution requires them to do that. They're just sufficiently afraid that judges might conclude that, that they suggest that you generally get a warrant. Um, so those are the, the sort of legal standards that apply under this statute. Um, yeah. So I, I just wanted to, to mention that um, in the wake of Jones, we have been, uh, the ACLU and the EMF and CDT and EPIC and other organizations have been trying to find every one of these location tracking cases and make the arguments in favor of a warrant and probable cause requirement. Um, you know, but the battlefield often keeps shifting just as technology keeps shifting. So for example, right now we've been very focused on cell phone tracking, um, but there are other forms of location tracking. Um, you know, when one form becomes less accessible, other forms become more accessible, and we've seen, for instance, automatic license plate readers um, prop, popping up with greater frequency all around the country. Um, so that's a brief Google overview. Ben, did you want to? Yeah, I want to talk about one point. So the, the government's argument here is that single tower data is so inaccurate. It's just, I mean, it, it, it's just a little bit of information. It, is, it you know, doesn't tell them which, which apartment you're in or which house you're in. The government's argument is that because single tower data is so inaccurate, they don't need a warrant to get it. And this may have been the case 20 years ago or 15 years ago when they first started making the argument. Um, but they haven't adjusted their legal theories to the, the changes in technology. And so as consumers increasingly use modern smartphones that are data hungry, the carriers have to respond to the surge in data usage by placing more and more towers in cities. And when you add more and more towers to a city, you have to shrink the coverage area around a tower miles today. It could be a single mile or half a mile. 
the government is still arguing that single tower data is not very accurate. In addition to this, uh, many of you, if you have crappy cell phone service in your home, may have called up the phone company, threatened to quit, or to threaten to cancel your contract, and then the phone company may have sent you a femtocell or a picocell. These are small cell towers that will likely cover just your living room or your, or your house. Uh, I, get, I get coverage in about half of my house with, with mine. Um, and with these single towers, I mean, the location information from, it, from those single towers is your house. That is the, the, the full range of those towers. The government hasn't addressed this point specifically, but there are more femto cells and pico cells out in the field now than there are regular towers. Now, obviously, you're, you're more likely to be talking to a regular tower because their range is larger, but the government's theories really haven't, really haven't matched up with the realities of cell phone tower deployment. The, they, the density of cell phone towers and the shrinking coverage area are right around them. So, there is the, the, what I hear from these two presentations is that there are some real anomalies um, in the law. Um, that Health insurance and it costs a lot of money to stop the huge surveillance team. Effort in order to, for example, learn how long each of the major carriers retains historical location information on each of us, right? And it varies substantially from company to company, so from six months to, in, in the case of AT and T, you know, all location information sent to July of 2008. Um, and I personally think that if I'm paying a bunch of money for, for, uh, you know, a cell phone, it would be nice to have access to basic information about what kind of privacy risks the company creates by retaining that information for, you know, months or even years at a time. Uh, I have a question for Ashton. He's actually knowing more about technology than me. That's your question. All right, go for it. So, so um, one thing I think it's worth, so, so while uh, law enforcement may not go to any of these companies or, or these third party services yet, if there is a standard for, say, GPS information, um, we'll, we're, I think we are going to see law enforcement go uh, for other forms of location identification. And so, uh, Mr. you want to talk about the, um, the Skype uh, IP address? Sure, there, there was a, a case uh, maybe five or six years ago. There was a, an American fugitive who was on the run. He disappeared. He was a, this is a white collar crime. Um, and he logged in from an internet cafe in Sri Lanka using Skype and made a single one minute call to one of his colleagues. And Skype handed over the IP address records of that call, which were sufficient to tip the police that he was in Sri Lanka. There are not that many Americans in Sri Lanka at any given time, and so it was pretty easy for them to then locate him after. Uh, so it's sometimes even country level location. Sure. So, so, so it depends on the purpose of the investigation, but you know, as we know, the data mining you piece things together. And so first, perhaps precise GPS location might not, um, you know, might, might have some protections down the line. We're going to find more and more that other types of location information might not have uh, the same type of protection.